Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. We're happy to have uh, Andrew Linshaw, who will tell us about vertex algebras and arc spaces. Okay, so thanks everybody for coming. So this is uh, this talk is mostly going to be expository and background material uh, for people that have never seen either or only one of these two subjects. And then only at the very end, if there's time, I'll mention some new results. And those new results are joint with Bywin Song. Um, give me one second. I'm having trouble. Um, moving it. There we go. Okay, so I'll start with vertex algebras. I'll give some examples, some basic constructions. Then I'll talk about arc spaces, which are seemingly unrelated construction in algebraic geometry, but they have a lot of connections with VOAs, and there are uh, results in VOAs that can be proven using geometry of arc spaces and vice versa. So I'll mention this and their connections, and then at the end, I'll talk about some non-new things. Okay, so first of all, vertex algebras are a, a class of algebraic structures that were introduced in the physics literature in the 1980s. In fact, all the main examples were known before they were given a proper definition by Borchers in his work on the Moonshine Conjecture. Um, so roughly speaking, vertex algebra is a vector space. Everything today will be over the complex numbers, but you can do this over any field or even over a ring. Um, it's linearly isomorphic to a certain algebra of formal power series with coefficients in NV. Um, and what I mean by an algebra, I'm going to say a little bit more about it later. So with some vector space, it can be thought of as a, isomorphic to a space of power series. Uh, and it typically has a grading by conformal weight. Uh, typically, the grading is by either the non-negative integers or non-negative half integers, but that's not always the case. And typically, the graded pieces are finite dimensional. So if this is the case, then there's a graded character, which is a formal series, the graded dimension. Q is here regarded as a formal variable. Um, and it's uh, offset by this constant Q to the minus C over 24, where C is a parameter called the central charge. This is called the graded character. So I'm just going to mention one spectacular example that plays no role in the talk, but it's, it's interesting. And this is the one, this is called the Moonshine Module. Um, this was constructed by Franco, Lepowski, and Merman in 1988. So it's a, a vertex algebra with some remarkable properties. So it's, uh, it has full automorphism group, the monster, uh, simple finite group. It's the biggest of the sporadic groups. It has this order. And the graded character of this vertex algebra uh, looks like this. So uh, the central charge is 24. And um, so what this says is that the weight uh, zero piece uh, is one dimensional. There's no weight one dimensional piece. And then weight two is this huge number, which is a, a dimension of irreducible representation of the monster. Um, and this is the, uh, the elliptic J function. Uh, offset by a constant. If, so if I interpret this formal variable Q as e to the two pi i tau, then this is the J function. Um, and this is a property that many vertex algebras have that their characters have um, modular properties and not just the character of the algebra, but also the character of its uh, irreducible modules. So I just wanna mention this in passing. Um, what I wanna do now is actually give you a definition of vertex algebra. So this typically takes about half of the talk and uh, but I think it's, it's an instructive to see this and I'm gonna take a slightly non-standard perspective that was developed by my advisor, uh, Bong Lian and his advisor, Zuckerman, a long time ago. So instead of focusing on the state space, I'm gonna focus on the fields. Essentially, that's what this does. And it makes the analogy with uh, usual linear algebra. So let me start with a, a vector space over the complex numbers. Um, typically V is infinite dimensional. There are no interesting examples where it's not infinite dimensional. Okay, so a uh, quantum operator on V will just be a linear map from V to the uh, space of formal Laurent series with coefficients in V. That's what this indicates. Um, so that's of course a vector space. I can talk about linear maps. And QOV will be the space of quantum operators. So two quantum operators I can add, I can scale or multiply them. This is a vector space. So an element of QOV can be represented as a formal power series with coefficients in NV. So what does this mean? Well, A is a map from V to here. So I just write down uh, this, uh, I write down this series where uh, I just collect all the coefficients. So a map from V to here is a bunch of maps from V to V. So I string them together. Um, I use the, the convention is to put the negative powers of Z with the positive ends. Okay, so a priori, this is just a, uh, 
a series like this where each of these ANs is an NV. But the fact that this maps to Laurent series imposes a finiteness condition that um, a of n uh, for a fixed vector v, um, a of n v will be zero eventually. Because if I plug in a fixed vector v, this is supposed to be a Laurent series. That means that fi only finitely many negative powers appear, and those are the ones that go with the positive ends. Okay, so it's this, uh, these things, uh, they can be bi infinite, but this finiteness condition is imposed. Okay, so notice that sitting inside of QOV is a copy of nv, which is just the space of constant maps. So constant maps mean all the, the only non-trivial endomorphisms are the one where I have the power z to the zero, which is a uh, minus one. Okay, so this is uh, a subspace, but it's more than a subspace. NV is actually an algebra. It's an associative algebra with a unit with respect to composition of maps. So a natural question is whether the algebraic structure on NV being an associative algebra, does that extend in some reasonable way to this much larger space QOV? Okay, so the first thing that you might try is to try to multiply two series pointwise. So just take, I want to define A, B of Z, multiply A of Z, B of Z. Well, this doesn't work because these are formal series and there are no convergence, no, no, no uh, convergence requirements are imposed. So this thing won't converge and each of the, the terms will be an infinite sum. And even on some fixed vec vector V, it'll still be an infinite sum. So this doesn't work, but there's a way to regulate this. It's called Wick's procedure. What I do is I take a series A of Z and I break it up into two parts, the minus and the plus part. So the minus is the part where I take the N less than zero terms. So this is actually just a Taylor series. These are all non-negative powers of Z. And the plus part is everything else where I take N greater than or equal to zero. And this, is a, uh, this has uh, only negative powers. So now suppose I fix a vector V and another element of QOV, I'll call it B. And let me look at two things. So let me look at B of Z, A plus of V acting on V. So A plus of V acting on V is a finite sum because A was a quantum operator and this only has positive powers, only finitely many of them act non-trivially in V. So A plus of V is a finite sum. And then when I act by B of Z on that, each term gives me a Laurent series. This is a finite sum of a Laurent series. So again, that's a Laurent series. And similarly, if I take A minus of Z and act on B of Z V, I claim that I get a Laurent series. So why is this? Well, B of Z acting on V is a Laurent series by definition, because B is a quantum operator. And then A minus is a Taylor series. If you act by a Taylor series and a Laurent series, you get a Laurent series because for each fixed power, you only have finitely many contributions to it. Okay, so the upshot of that is that these two terms, B of Z, A plus of Z, and also A minus of Z, B of Z, when I apply them to V, I get a Laurent series. So that means that this linear combination is a quantum operator. By definition, it takes V to a Laurent series. So this is my definition of the Wick product. So it's not quite, multiplying A of Z by B of Z pointwise, but it's moving the plus part to the right and then taking this combination. Okay, so I call this the Wick product or the normally ordered product. And sometimes I leave out my formal variable. When, so A and B here are series, but I often will leave that out. Okay, so it's easy to see that this is a bilinear operation. And the other thing that's apparent is that this really does extend the usual product operation on NV. So NV, remember, was the subspace of constant power series. If you go back, uh, a constant power series, that just means that you have the Z to the zero term. Well, that one appears over here. So A minus of Z is the same thing as A of Z when A is a, a constant series. So A is A minus, this width product is the usual product. And also the identity um, and the morphism uh, thought of as a constant and amorphism. This behaves as a left and right unit on all of Q of B with respect to this Wick product. Okay, so we have successfully extended this algebraic structure, but there's a, a price to be paid. It's not associative anymore. So when I take iterated Wick products, I have to have a convention. It matters where I put the parentheses. So the convention is to do it from uh, right to left and uh, inductively for uh, as many as I want. Okay, 
So this QOV has actually more products than just this with product. It has a whole family indexed by the integers that I'll call the, the nth products. Okay. So the ones for n greater than or equal to zero and n less than zero are defined in a different way. So let me start with the negative ones first. So n is greater than or equal to zero. These are the negative products. So the way that I get these is I, I build them from the whip product that I just defined and the derivative operator, ddz, I can do to a series. So I, to take the minus n minus one product, I first take the nth derivative of a, then I take whip product with b, and I rescale by one over n factorial. Okay, so in particular, if n is zero, then I get the minus one product, that's just the whip product. So the whip product is now part of this larger family. Okay, for n greater than or equal to zero, the non-negative ones are defined differently. So um, what I do is I have a, a two formal variables, z and w. Um, the bracket of a of z, b and w makes sense. So even though I couldn't multiply a of z and b of z, I can multiply a of z, b of w because they're two different variables. And the coefficient of each um, monomial is still uh, finite. Uh, it still makes sense. And uh, I can take the formal bracket I can multiply it by this polynomial z minus w to the n. This is a series in two variables. And I take the z residue, which means pick out the coefficient of z to the minus one. What's left is a series in w. And you have to show that this is a quantum operator that any test vector gets sent to a Laurent series. That's a straightforward calculation. So this is another family of uh, bilinear operations that I have. Okay, so this object, this vector space QOV has now a family of operations. One of them is the width product. And now I can define a quantum operator to be a subspace of QOV. So it's a vector space. It contains one and it's closed under all the products that we just defined. Okay, so in particular, it's closed under this derivative operation because the derivative of A is the same thing as uh, derivative of A width product one, and that's A minus two one and it's closed under all the products, in particular the minus two product. So once you have this notion, you can define usual formal algebraic notions. You can define homomorphisms of uh, quantum operators. These are just linear maps that intertwine the products. Ideals are subspaces that are closed under left and right operation by all these products. A quotient by an ideal is another QOA. A module over a QOA is a vector space M together with a linear map from A to QOM. So in this, from this perspective, um, QOM is playing the role that end of M plays in linear algebra. Normally a module over an associative algebra is a map of associative algebras from A to end of M. Well, here you replace end by QO. Okay, so QO of V is way too big to be a vertex algebra. So this is a kind of intermediate concept. So there's a very strong condition that one wants to impose on elements of QO V, which is the locality condition. So this says that, so I say the two elements are local if the formal commutator of A of Z and B of W is not necessarily zero, but it's annihilated by some positive power of Z minus W. So it's sort of supported along the diagonal. Um, if this is the case, then uh, you know, from the definition of the nth products, um, the, uh, if this quantity is zero, then the residue is certainly zero. So for all, n greater than or equal to this constant n, uh, these products vanish. So only finitely many of the non-negative products will not be non-zero, okay? Incidentally, this, this n, there's no uniform bound on n. So unless the vertex algebra is abelian, um, um, there's, uh, for every a and b, there exists an n, but it depends on a and b, and there's no bound. Okay, so now we can define a vertex algebra. So it's a, a QOA whose elements are pairwise local. So this seems like a very difficult condition to check. The reason why it's workable is because of Dong's lemma. So Dong's lemma says that if you're in a QO, if you're in QOV and you have three elements that are pairwise local, then anything that you build from two of them by these products, so B and C for some N, A is local with that. And then so inductively, all you can make very complicated words that are built from these elements and various products, and they're all local because this propagates. So you can check this inductively on length. So vertex algebras are often constructed by starting with a set, maybe a very small set, maybe a set with just one element, and then checking pairwise locality. 
and then whatever they generate, that will be a vertex algebra. So you can say that the, if this is the case, the vertex algebra generated is just spanned by all the words in the generators in these products. And sometimes it only has one, and then there's only one thing to check. So the, the perspective that I've given here is that a vertex algebra is realized inside QOV for some V. So this is sort of like defining a group by representing it as a, as the matrix group. But the group itself has a independent abstract meaning. And it's the same for uh, vertex algebras. So it turns out that if I give you a vertex algebra inside QOV for some V, then this a always has a faithful representation inside QOA, where you can replace this vector space V that it was represented on by A itself. And so without loss of generality, I can always assume that A is realized inside QOA. So um, this uh, A can be taken to be this vector space V. Okay, so this definition is probably hard to have any sense of what these look like. So I wanna give you, I wanna say a few more general things first and then give you some example. Okay, so, so the, there's a operator product expansion is a, a identity of series that is a nice way to package the non-negative circle product, these uh, products and products. So given uh, two elements of a vertex algebra, uh, this is a series identity. So if I were to write down A of Z, B of W, again, this makes sense because A of Z and B of W are in different formal variables. Um, there's a part that is regular at z equals w. And then because this doesn't make sense for z equals w, there's also a part which is polar. And I can regard this as a meromorphic, uh, I want to think of this as a meromorphic function with poles along z equals w. And it turns out that just based on the, the definitions that I wrote down, that this is the sum of uh, a uh, p product b thought of as a series in w, z minus w to the minus p minus one plus the regular part. And this is a finite sum because A and B are local, so only finitely many of these are non-zero. So you can think of A P product B as being the, uh, the polar part of order P plus one in this expansion. And this is useful for doing computations. Um, often we don't care about this regular part, we just write equal modulo the regular part. And so a lot of the information about a vertex algebra is contained in these non-negative products. And maybe the, the uh, way to think about it is that writing down some generators for a vertex algebra and these products is sort of like giving a Lie algebra and a presentation of it. These are sort of like the brackets in the Lie algebra. And then the whole structure is analogous to the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra. So a lot of information is contained in this. And this is typically the way vertex algebras are uh, presented. Okay. so. The most basic uh, example that's not abelian is the Heisenberg algebra. So let me try to define this example. So I start with uh, an abelian Lie algebra. It's just the uh, polynomials in T and T inverse. T is a formal variable. So this is, you know, it's a commutative ring, but I think of it as an abelian Lie algebra. As such, it has a one dimensional central extension, which is non trivial. And the bracket of T to the N and T to the M. In, a, in, in here it was zero, but in this central extension, it becomes non-trivial when n equals minus m. And then you get uh, a multiple of the central term, everything else is, uh, commutes. So this is the uh, heisenberg Lie algebra. Now I'm gonna define a module over this. So I could define this as an induced module, give this a grading and define it as an induced module. That's equivalent to what I'm gonna say, but here's sort of a more, uh, sort of pedestrian way to say this. So let me define a vector space to be a polynomial ring on a bunch of variables, t to the minus one, t to the minus two, t to the minus three, et cetera. Okay. So these variables are algebraically independent. So in this notation, t to the minus one times t to the minus two is not t to the minus three. It's just t to the minus one, t to the minus two. Okay. So this is a big polynomial ring. And the action of this Lie algebra on V is gonna be as follows. Half of them are gonna act by left multiplication. So the ones that look like the ones in V, the negative powers, they just act by left multiplication. The non-negative ones act by differentiation with this constant and the derivative with respect to T to the minus N. Uh, that's what the, the positive ones do. And then the, the uh, zero one acts by zero, T to the zero, because you know that also works for N equals zero. And then this kappa acts by the identity. 
So it's not difficult to check that this really is a representation of this Lie algebra. Um, now, uh, I've just defined an action. So I'm gonna give a name to the linear map that represents T to the N. Let me call it B of N. So some of these are differentiation, some of them are left multiplications. B of N just denotes the linear map on V represented by T to the N. And now I'm gonna write down a generating function, B of Z, is uh, the sum of b to the n z to the minus n minus one. So this z is just another formal variable. I've strung together these endomorphisms to make a series. So I claim that this b of z not only is a nv valued uh, by infinite series, but it actually lives in q of v. It has the finiteness property that I want. So what is this finiteness property? It means that for a fixed vector, uh, the b of n should act by zero when n is sufficiently large. So what does a fixed vector look like? Well, in this polynomial ring, it's a polynomial in these variables. So that means it depends on only finitely many of these t to the minus k's, okay? So now what are these bn's when n is positive? They're differentiation with respect to t to the minus n. Well, if n is sufficiently large, if it's bigger than all of the t to the minus k's that appear in my test vector, then I'm differentiating with respect to a variable that doesn't appear, then it's zero. So that's why this lives in Q of B. Okay, so now what I have to do is I wanna check that this is local of itself. So I have to write down this formal commutator. And so what I do is I write this down and using the uh, Lie bracket relations in this Lie algebra, this is a, a first derivative of the so-called delta function. And it's easy to check that it's not zero, but it's killed by Z minus W squared. So it's local of order two. So, because I've checked that the single element is local with itself, whatever it generates must be a vertex algebra. That's called the Heisenberg vertex algebra. So a priori, the Heisenberg vertex algebra is spanned by all the words in this generator and all these products. So it's a little bit not obvious what it might look like, but actually we can write down a basis for it pretty easily. So I also should write down the OPE. This, uh, the OPE between B and itself is just one Z minus W to the minus two. There's only one term, uh, one of these polar terms, which is non-trivial, it's the second order pole. So that means that B, uh, one product B is one, all the other ones are zero, all the other non-negative products. And so it turns out that it has a basis that consists of iterated WIC products of this generator and its derivatives. And if I order it so that these number, these, the, how the order of differentiation is in this uh, weakly decreasing way, uh, this is a basis. So as a vector space, this H looks just like polynomials in B, the derivative of B, the second derivative, et cetera. And that's isomorphic to the vector space that I started with, polynomials on all these variables. I just assign, you know, the k derivative corresponds to t to the minus k. Maybe you can rescale it by some factorial, it doesn't matter. So as a vector space, this, uh, this is a basis. It looks like a differential polynomial algebra with one generator. That's of course only as a vector space. The, the vertex algebra structure is more complicated. So for example, if I take the product of B with itself, and then I multiply that by, again, the product of B with itself, I don't get just the product of four, that's my leading term, but then I've got subleading terms, only one subleading term here. In general, it's complicated. You see that it's not associative here. The, the, in some sense, the OPE structure, the non-negative products, you can think of as measuring the non-associativity and non-commutativity of the work product. It tells you how to do these corrections. Okay, so um, more generally, so this is our first example. More generally, many vertex algebras that one meets have a similar behavior, and I'm gonna call this strong generation. So we'll say that a vertex algebra is strongly generated by a set if it's spanned by all the iterated WIC products of generators and their derivatives. So when I said generated, I'm allowed to use all these products, not just the negative products but the, the products of the WIC products of generators and their derivatives, that's also the same as the negative products. So it's not completely obvious that you can find such a generating set, such a finite one. In fact, not all vertex algebras are finitely strongly generated, but many of them are. And here I've written this down as a finite set. That's not necessary. Also, I've done this so that these Ks are weakly decreasing for each type of generator. So this is kind of like a PBW basis. So if V is, uh, 
uh, strongly gen V is strongly generated by such a set if it's spanned by all these binomials. There may be relations among these, but in particular, it's uh, generated by this set as a differential algebra under the Wick product. So the Heisenberg algebra is like that. Many of them are like that. And we'll say further that this set freely generates, if not only does it strongly generate, but these PBW binomials are actually a basis. And that means that the, as a vector space, V is isomorphic, not just to a differential algebra, but differential polynomial algebra with no non-trivial relations. And so for example, the Heisenberg algebra is freely generated. Okay, so there are other freely generated algebras. I'm gonna just introduce one, more and then one more example after that. So another class that's quite large and important is the affine vertex algebras. So these are constructed starting from a simple finite dimensional E algebra, G. So I take its uh, loop algebra and then I have a central extension, the uh, uh, Katsubuti uh, affine Lie algebra. And the affine vertex algebra, uh, I'll denote by VKG. So for every uh, K is a complex parameter called the level. Uh, it's a vertex algebra, which is linearly isomorphic to a certain uh, G hat module that's called the vacuum module. And it constructed in a way that's quite similar to the Heisenberg algebra. If I fix a basis for my Lie algebra, then this affine Lie algebra, affine vertex algebra is freely generated by vertex operators that correspond to the basis vectors. Um, and actually G doesn't have to be simple. It could be abelian. If I take G to be the one dimensional, Lie algebra with non-trivial bilinear form, I get the Heisenberg algebra. So this is a general addition of that. And the OPEs are similar. There's a first order pull where I see the, the field corresponding to the bracket of uh, these two Lie algebra elements. And then there's a second order pull, which is just the bilinear form multiplied by K and that's it. So if the Lie algebra is abelian, this one disappears and I only see this, okay? So, um, now, their, their freely generated vertex algebra is actually quite rare. So uh, most of the time, vertex algebras are not freely generated. And they're not also, they're not even quotients of freely generated vertex algebras. There, there must be some non-trivial relations among the monomials of this kind for the vertex algebra axioms to hold. Um, so, but there, there is a big class of freely generated vertex algebras that are called W algebras that are associated to Lie algebra and a nilpotent element. So I'm just gonna introduce the first uh, sort of interesting example, which this one is called the Zemologikov W3 algebra. Uh, and this was actually defined before a general definition existed. This is the one that comes from SL3 with its principal nilpotent elements. So this has two generators, uh, I'll call them L and W. And so this OPE relation, if you've seen this before, it means that L is a Virasoro element. The second one says that W is primary of weight three. That means that it generates a highest weight vector for the action of the Virasoro, uh, Lie, Virasoro algebra. And then the, the last one is the one that's more interesting, the OPE of W with itself. So W is, is weight three according to this second one. So the leading pole should be sixth order pole. And there's a fourth order pull, a third order pull, et cetera. So this is a little bit more complicated. The thing that's notable here compared to the previous examples is the presence of this nonlinear term, the product of L with L. And so a typical OPE algebra for a finitely generated, strongly finitely generated vertex algebra has many terms which are nonlinear, but they can be expressed in terms of generators. This is the, the simplest nonlinear one. Okay. And this I said is freely generated. Okay. So I wanna introduce, uh, I wanna do one more thing before I switch gears and talk about arc spaces. I wanna introduce a, uh, a certain functor from vertex algebras to commutative rings that was introduced by Zhu in his thesis a long time ago. So for every vertex algebra, I can consider a certain linear subspace. It's the span of all the things that look like a derivative times something else. So you know, B could be one, this could just be the derivative A. So, and it, in, inductively, those are all the normal ordered products of things where at least one derivative appears. So I just mod those out. And what's left is all the things that have no derivatives. And the vector space quotients by this ideal, I call R sub V. Um, and images of things in R, so this, sorry, this is a typo. This should be R sub V, not R of V. Uh, images of things in this quotient, I'll, I'll denote with this bar. So A goes to A bar. 
So in Gilles' thesis, he proved that RV is a commutative associative algebra, and it has a product that's induced by the Wick product. So A bar times B bar is just, I take the Wick product of AB and I take the bar. So in other words, the, uh, all the non-associativity and non-commutativity uh, lies in the C of V, and it goes away when I take this quotient with respect to the Wick product. Also, the derivatives go away. So this is something fairly small. This is called Zhu's commutative algebra. And um, Arakawa in 2012 had the idea that one should look at the, the uh, corresponding scheme and corresponding variety. So if I take spec of this commutative ring, that's called the associated scheme, and the corresponding reduced scheme is called the associated variety. Um, and strong generators for the vertex algebra always give rise to generators for RV as a commutative ring. So if V is strongly finitely generated, then these are varieties of or schemes of finite type. This actually is if and only if. So this uh, variety has very inf interesting information about not just the structure, but also representation theory of the vertex algebra. So let me just give a few examples. So for the Heisenberg algebra, um, the uh, RV is just polynomials in B with no relations. So the corresponding variety is just the affine line, just the complex numbers. Um, for the affine vertex algebra, um, this is again, because it's freely generated, there are no relations, it's just polynomials in G star. So the corresponding variety is uh, G, which we can identify with G star. Um, for this uh, W3 algebra, it's polynomials in C and L and W, again, with no relations. So the corresponding variety is C2. And in general, for freely generated vertex algebras with M generators, the associated variety is CM. So here it's not very interesting. It's much more interesting when the vertex algebra is not freely generated. So if it's strongly but not freely generated by some generators, then as I said, it's generated by the corresponding generators. So this is, it looks like polynomials. And these things mod some ideal. Here's one example where we can easily say what it is. For, if I take this W3 algebra at a particular central charge minus two, and then I take the simple quotient, um, the, there are relations among the generators and they give rise to relations in this Zhu commutative algebra. It turns out to be this uh, cuspidal curve, polynomials in L and W mod a single polynomial relation, W squared equals L cubed. Okay. So I should say a few words about this. So, so the, uh, it's an active area of research to understand the structure of the associated variety. So there's a lot that's not known. Um, so, but it is known that the, uh, the so, so one case that's kind of extreme is when the associated variety is just a point, which is to say that the, that the Zhu commutative ring is, uh, is, is finite dimensional as a vector space. So the, the scheme might be not just one point, but the variety will be one point. That's equivalent to Zhu's uh, C2 cofinitness condition. And it's known that that has very strong implications for the representation theory. It means that vertex algebra has only finitely many uh, simple modules. So the, there's a generalization of this condition uh, called the quasi Lies condition, where the, the associated variety is a Poisson variety with uh, uh, finitely many symplectic leaves. So this is also a very strong condition, and that implies that the uh, the category of ordinary modules has finitely many simple objects. So there may be many other objects that are not ordinary modules, but the, the n gradable ones uh, are with finite dimensional graded pieces that are the, the n gradable modules that are irreducible. There's only finitely many. Um, so there's a lot of things that are interesting to ask about associated variety. So one question is, um, are properties of it preserved under operations on vertex algebras, like taking invariants under a finite group or taking cosets? So these are major open questions. So for example, if I take a, a vertex algebra and it has uh, one dimensional associated variety, meaning that it's uh, C2 cofinite, and then I take finite group invariants, it's not known whether that is also uh, uh, C2 cofinite. More generally, one expects that for finite group invariants, the dimension of the associated variety is preserved. So it's true in a lot of examples, but there's no general theorem like that. Okay, so any questions so far about vertex algebras? So, so I'm going to change gears now and then talk about arc spaces and then go back and connect them. So this is a construction in algebraic geometry. So I 
I can, this can be done over a field of arbitrary characteristic, but just to make things easier, I'll only talk about complex numbers. So X, let's say X is a scheme of finite type. This, uh, there's another scheme that's called X infinity, that's arc space of X. And maybe the best way to characterize it is by its uh, functor of points. So for a commutative ring A, the uh, A valued points of X infinity are in bijection with the uh, A of T valued points of X. So this is power series in T. So I, I can say this in this way, HOM of spec A to X infinity is, is the same as HOM spec A of T to X. So defining it this way, the functoriality is clear just by composition of a map from X to Y gives you a, a, a map from X infinity to Y infinity. So uh, if this makes sense for any scheme, but let's take X to be an affine scheme, which for my purposes is enough, then I can be much more explicit about what this looks like. So let's say that X is spec R and R is some nice finitely presented uh, commutative ring. So polynomials and N variables mod some finitely generated ideal. So um, as I said before, this, I want to specialize to the C valued points of X infinity. Those are the CT valued points of X. So what does a morphism, an arc or morphism from spec C of T to uh, this uh, X, X's spec of this ring, what does this look like? Well, it corresponds to a ring homomorphism from this ring R to this uh, ring of power series. So a ring homomorphism from R, from R to anything is determined by its value on the generators. So let's see what this looks like. So each of these XIs, these generators, phi of it is going to be some power series in the formal variable T. So let's give some name to these coefficients, XI of zero, XI one, XI two, et cetera. And then um, the fact that this is a homomorphism means that the image of this has to be killed by FL. All the generators for the ideal, they have to act by zero. So FL, if I plug in this series, et cetera, all these series, then I get zero. So if I were to write this down and collect the powers of T, there's a very nice interpretation for what happens. So let me take a little detour and then interpret this. Okay, the idea here is that I want to give, uh, the, I want to give coordinates and uh, I want to give uh, generators and relations for X infinity as an affine scheme. So it also is going to be uh, a nice quotient of array. So first of all, these xijs, those are going to be my coordinate functions. So these coefficients of the power series, those will be my coordinate functions for x infinity. So, so this is going to be spec of some quotient of the polynomial ring and all the xijs. So this polynomial ring has a derivation, and I can define it in the following way. I first define it on the generators. It's going to take xij to xij plus 1. It just raises this index. Sometimes in other formulations, there's a, a constant here. Uh, this, but I'm going to just normalize it in this way. It doesn't matter; it's just a matter of choice. Um, so now that I've defined it on the generators, I can extend it by the Leibniz rule to monomials in the generators, and then extend by linearity to the polynomial. So, for example, here's some polynomial in these uh, generators. If I take d of it, well, d of x13 becomes x14. It just raises this index to a four. D of x2, four cubed is going to be three x2, four squared times the derivative of x2, four, which is x2, five, et cetera. This one becomes uh, x3, five, seven, x3, five to the six times x3, six, and then seven times two is 14. That's how this looks. And so in particular, I can, uh, I can apply this derivative operator to my generators for the ideal, the FLs. And so FLR is going to just denote the rth derivative of FL. That's a perfectly well-defined polynomial in this big polynomial ring. And then this requirement that uh, the images of the generators satisfy my relations, that translates to the following thing, that if I take the derivatives of these Ls, FLs, the rth derivative of FL, well, FL only depended on the zero variables, but rth derivative can depend all the way up to the rth variables. It has to vanish as a function of these things. That's what the, the, this condition translates to. Okay, so that tells us that 
X infinity is actually also affine scheme. It's spec R infinity, where R infinity is the ring. It's the polynomial ring on all the X I J's. And then what I mod out by is, is the, all the derivatives of the generators F1 to FK. Okay. And so I can, if I identify Xi with the zeroth copy, Xi zero, R is naturally a subring of R infinity. And according to my definition, um, R generates R infinity as a differential algebra. And the ideal of all the relations among the Xj's, Xji's, first of all, the ideal of relations is a differential ideal. It's closed under taking the derivative. And it's generated as a differential ideal by the F L, uh, I think my notation here is not good. Well, I, anyway, this I think I used a different letter here before, but it's generated by the original one and the derivatives. Okay, so R infinity also satisfies a universal property. It's the the, the largest uh, differential commutative ring generated by R in an appropriate sense. So if S is any differential commutative ring that contains R and is generated by R as a differential ring, then S is a quotient of R infinity. Okay, so, so there's a lot that, these are interesting uh, algebras and they carry information about the, the singularities of uh, X. And uh, there's a lot of things that are not known about uh, arc spaces. So, so one thing that's known is that if, if X is irreducible, then, then X infinity is irreducible. But it's not the case that if uh, R is a reduced ring, then R infinity is a reduced ring. R infinity can have no potency even if R is a reduced ring. And so one interesting question is, what is the structure of the nil radical? And is it finitely generated as a differential ideal? And that's not known. It's known in a few examples, but there's no general theory for that. Okay. So let me go back to vertex algebras. So um, every vertex algebra has a canonical filtration, a decreasing filtration called the Lees filtration. So uh, it's a decreasing filtration. The P filtered part is defined to be the span of all products of things where the total number of derivatives is at least P. Okay, so F zero V is of course just V. There's at least zero derivatives, there's no condition. And if I take, if I apply the derivative to FP, then I'd sit inside FP plus one, I raise the number of derivatives. So the graded object, you associate a graded object with, res, with respect to this filtration, I'll call it GER V, and I have a projection, sigma P maps FP to the uh, P th graded piece of the graded algebra. So this is always for any vertex algebra, a differential graded commutative ring. Um, and what does the product look like? Well, if something is an FP and something is an FQ, if these represent things in the graded, then you know, sigma P A, sigma Q B is going to be, I take the Wick product that I apply, uh, project onto the P plus Q's graded part. And also the derivative, uh, what do I do? I take the derivative of A and then I project onto the P plus one graded part. So this gives it the structure of a differential graded ring. Notice also that, that RV, the way I, the thing I defined before, it was V mod C of D. It's exactly the first graded piece of the graded object because FO of V is just V. And then this F1 of V is the same thing as C of V, this Ju commutative, uh, this I thing I took the quotient of. And so it's also not difficult to show that that RV generates the graded V as the differential algebra. Okay, so here's a few examples. And these are sort of easy examples because my vertex algebras are freely generated. So the graded object of the Heisenberg algebra is just the differential polynomial ring in one variable. The affine vertex algebra is the differential polynomial in G. Uh, I take a basis for, for the Lie algebra, just differential polynomial algebra. Same thing for the, this W3 algebra. It's just differential polynomial algebra in two variables. So in general, for something freely generated, that's the case, it's a differential polynomial algebra. If V is strongly but not freely generated, then it's a quotient of a differential polynomial algebra on the generators. But it's very difficult to de describe I. So in fact, there's very few examples where this is completely described. So the issue is that, that all the, the relations that appear uh, in the first graded piece have to appear, but it's not clear that you get all the relations that way. Maybe there are additional relations in I that you can't get from the relations in, 
in R of H. That's why this is difficult. And so here's an example. The example I mentioned where I take the, the W3 algebra, the simple W3 algebra, the central charge minus two. I told you before that the ideal in RV is generated by this polynomial. But even in this example, we don't know what the graded algebra looks like. like we don't know whether, uh, we do know that this is not uh, everything. We know that, so the, one issue here is that if I take this, uh, cuspidal curve and I take its arc space, I take the all the relations that come from just the gener this one and their derivatives, there are some nilpotents in this one. And in the graded algebra, the nilpotents vanish. They're not nilpotent, they're actually zero in the graded algebra. But we don't know whether uh, there are other relations. So this is a, seems like a very basic example that it's not known here. But what I can say is that because uh, RV generates the graded algebra as a differential algebra. Because of the universal property of uh, arc spaces, RV infinity, this is the functions on the arc space, uh, this maps surjectively to graded V because of the universal property. So if this were an isomorphism, that would be exactly the statement that this ideal is generated by the, the ideal RV. When it fails to be, it means that the ideal is bigger. Okay, so um, it is uh, natural to ask the following questions. So, so you know, when is this phi an isomorphism? In other words, when is this I generated by the, the relations with no derivatives? Um, if it's not an isomorphism, then maybe it becomes an isomorphism if I pass to the reduced names. That actually is the case in that example of W3. Even though I don't know what the nil radical is on the left, that's also an open question. Uh, we believe it's generated by two things, but that's not known. And we also don't know what the nil radical and the graded algebra is, but if I mod out by those, then this becomes an isomorphism in that example. So when does this property occur? And in the event that it's not uh, injective, is the kernel finitely generated as differential ideal? Those are natural questions to ask. It's very useful to know that it's an isomorphism. So if it's true, it really can be thought of as saying that the vertex algebra is a quantization of the arc space or the little functions in the arc space. So then the arc space has a lot of information about the vertex algebra. So if V is freely generated, this is always an isomorphism. And that's very easy. So the, the non-freely generated examples setting is much more interesting. So, so um, there is a theorem of Arakawa. I think this is the only general result like this, that if V is simple and quasi lease quasi lease is this geometric convention I mentioned before in the associated variety, then this phi may not be an isomorphism, but it's always an iso isomorphism on the reduced rings. So there are some known cases where it really is an isomorphism. And so this is a result of uh, Ben Ecker and Alwani from 2019 that for uh, affine SL2 at positive integer level. This notation means the simple quotient, the universal affine SL2. Um, so these are rational VOAs. So in the rational, there's nothing to say about the reduced ones. They're all, uh, the, affine, the associated variety is one point. Everything is nilpotent, but still at the level of schemes, this is an isomorphism. So this is a very non-trivial statement. And also for Virsoro minimal models, uh, Vir2P, uh, this also is an isomorphism. And actually, they proved more. They showed that for the Virasora minimal models, the PQ minimal models, this is only an isomorphism if P is 2. And the, the first case where it's not, Vir 3, 4, they also showed that the kernel of this map, which is non trivial, is, is finitely generated. It's actually one generator. This is, until very recently, the only example where that's more complete description of the ideal of this map is known. Okay, so there are some other examples also of uh, VOAs that are uh, classically free. There's some other uh, authors. There's uh, Antonios, uh, Howie, uh, his student, uh, maybe a few other people that have some few more examples. I think their examples are um, involved principal subspaces. So now what I want to do in the last few minutes is, is say a little bit about my recent work with uh, Bailin Song. One of the things that we do is give more such examples. So. The, the, uh, so what we study uh, is a problem that, it's a classical problem, classical invariant theory problem, but it has applications to vertex algebra. So the, the setup is that we're interested in the 
the uh, analog of classical invariant theory for arc spaces. So classical invariant theory, the setup is I have a group, algebraic group, it acts on a, say, a vector space, and I'm interested in the ring of invariant functions, uh, CVG. And so if you have this setup of G acts on V, then I can take the arc space of this group. G infinity is also an algebraic group. Uh, it's not a finite type, but it's some unipotent extension of G. And G infinity acts on the arc space of V, it acts on V infinity. And so what I'm interested in is the, uh, the G infinity invariance on the functions on V infinity. I can also, I can consider the, the categorical quotients. V mod mod G is the spec of the ring of invariance. And the quotient morphism, V to V mod mod G, this is the induced morphism that comes from the embedding of the invariant ring and just C of V. This induces a morphism from V infinity to V mod mod G infinity. So I have a morphism from V mod mod, so V infinity mod mod G infinity to here. Um, this is this just comes from the fact that the uh, ring of, of functions on uh, that if I take the uh, uh, invariant functions and I take the arcs on that that maps to uh, all the functions on V and it lands in the in G infinity invariant functions. So I have this homomorphism of rings from functions on the arc space of the uh, the quotients to the G infinity invariants and in V infinity. This map is in general not injective or surjective. So, for example, if G is finite, it's never surjective. Even for Z2 acting on the one dimensional space, this fails to be injective. Um, if, uh, and then there are also examples where this fails to be, uh, I'm sorry, it, I said this wrong. For finite groups, this, is, this fails to be surjective. It misses a lot of things in the image. Um, but there are also examples where it has a kernel, and this can happen, for example, if, so V mod mod G, the arc space can be non-reduced. There can be uh, no potence in the ring of functions here. But this is always an integral domain. This is a subalgebra of a polynomial ring. So the, the no radical always lies in the kernel of this map. So in general, it's neither injective nor surjective, but there are some nice examples where this is an isomorphism. So in particular, if, the, if V mod mod G is a polynomial, this is always an isomorphism. And also, if uh, it's a complete intersection, this is an isomorphism. But there are many examples where those are not the case and we'd still like to know. So actually, it's very rare that it's an isomorphism. But what <laughs> was shown recently is that for certain, uh, for certain nice representations of certain classical groups, this is an isomorphism. So the ones that we consider, these are the ones that appear in Vile's first and second fundamental theorems of invariant theory, the, the standard representation, and it's dual in the case of type A. So if G is GLN, let's start with, <coughs> I take the standard representation, just to the end, and then I take a V to be a sum of a bunch of copies of the standard and a bunch of copies of the dual. Um, so this is the, the ring of invariance on this is uh, what's de described by Vile's first and second fundamental theorems of invariant theory. So it's generated by quadratics and the relations of all determinants. Um, so the statement here is that for all P and Q, this is an isomorphism. So when, when P and Q are sufficiently large, these rings are not complete intersections, but still these are, this is always an isomorphism. Similar statement for the symplectic group. So if I take the symplectic group, and then I take uh, many copies of the standard representation, then this, map is all, also always an isomorphism. So always an isomorphism means that, that uh, this, the, the, the uh, arc space functor commutes with the invariant functor in appropriate steps. And for the, the SLN, it's a little bit more complicated. So if I take uh, the same representation, a bunch of copies of the standard and a bunch of copies of the dual, then this is not always an isomorphism. So if P and Q are sufficiently small, if, if both of them are less than or equal to N plus two, then this is always an isomorphism. But if one of them, either one of them is N plus three or more, then it's surjective, but it's no longer injective. And what happens is that the uh, V mod mod G, if I take its arc space, then that acquires a kernel. And it turns out that this is a case where the kernel can be completely described as a differential ideal and it's finally generated as a differential ideal. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna mention some of the applications that these results have to vertex algebras. So one thing that one can do is, uh, is describe uh, so-called coset vertex algebras. So if you have a vertex algebra and a subalgebra, you can consider this, this subset of the big vertex algebra that commutes with everything in the subalgebra. So this is like the commutant in the theory of associative algebras. That's always a vertex subalgebra. Typically, it's very difficult to describe it, to find generators for it. Uh, in the case where the subalgebra is an affine vertex algebra, and the big algebra is a free field algebra, it's also, it's difficult to do it, but it can be solved using uh, the invariant theory of arc spaces. So there's a bunch of examples where one can give minimal generating sets for these cosets and identify them with things that are interesting. Uh, so using the results for uh, SLN, we get examples where we, uh, this map phi that I defined before uh, has a kernel and the kernel corresponds to the nil radical of such a uh, arc space. So we get it find a generating set as a differential ideal. So we also get many new examples of classically free vertex algebras. And so one of the families of examples is uh, affine SP2N. So this comes from this invariant theory result for SP2N. Uh, so for all positive integers, K and N, these are now classically free. So this generalizes the case SP2, which was known in a different way. Um, the way that this goes is that inside a, a fermionic vertex algebra, it's a, a, a free fermion vertex algebra, there's a commuting action of LK SP2N and L uh, N SP2K. Uh, and the, uh, anyway, the, this is the, uh, the origin of how one applies this. So we realize this one is a coset inside some fermionic versus algebra. And then uh, the result that I mentioned for invariant theory also works for odd variables. When uh, I have such a strong statement for even variables, it can be a similar statement for odd variables can be deduced. Um, and one more application is that, that the, these results in invariant theory give a description of the uh, global section algebra chiral Duram complex for Calbi-Yau manifolds and hyper Kähler manifolds. So the chiral Duram complex is a, a sheaf of vertex algebras that exists on smooth manifolds and in either algebraic setting, complex analytic setting or smooth setting. Um, and the, so locally it looks like a certain free field algebra, so-called BC beta gamma system, but then this exists globally and the description of the global sections is difficult. So in, the manifold has extra structure like a Calbi-Yau structure, then the global section algebra has some extra things that are known. So it has an N equals two superconformal structure. And then actually it has a little bit more, it has something called an Odaki algebra. So this was known in some work of uh, Alwani a long time ago and some collaborators, but, uh, but that turns out to be the whole structure. So this global section al algebra is, gen is, is actually the sub V array generated by eight fields. And for hyper Kähler manifolds, it was known a long time ago that it has a N equals four superconformal structure. That also turns out to be the whole structure. And that uh, those statements can be reduced to uh, these statements uh, about invariant theory of arc spaces. Okay, so I'm out of time. I'm gonna stop here. Thanks very much. And uh, I can, any questions? Uh, first, let's thank uh, Andy for that very nice talk. <laughs> uh, for recording.